Good morning, I'm Van Rogerson, President and CEO of NC East Alliance. Thank you for joining us today. I'm excited to hear uh, this presentation is, um, we're doing it jointly with Electric Cities. Electric Cities, thank you, Brenda, Jennings, the whole team, Lacey and Elliot that's a part of that for this presentation this morning. I always enjoy hearing um, what's going on in the retail world, particularly since I'm buying more and more packages for Christmas online and the world is <laughs> different. And I go to Walmart, they stick groceries in the back of the car, even down in Williamston, North Carolina. So that's pretty, pretty incredible. Um, moving along though, let me just quickly thank our sponsors that help us do this advocacy that we're working on. First, our platinum sponsors, ECU, Vidant, Integrated Financial Holdings, Bulling Company, then our gold sponsors, Beaufort County, Dominion Energy, Silver Sponsors, Evolve, Martin Marietta, Port of Virginia, Nutrien, Martin County, Kilpatrick Townsend, and Duke Energy. Um, so thank you all sponsors for sponsoring with us. Most of all today in that, um, in the, the list of sponsors is, is Electra City. She was a gold sponsor. I didn't mention her as I was floating through there, but they do a lot of stuff with us. So I'm going to turn this over to Jennings Gray from Electra City. He's going to be the moderator of this um, little event we have. And thank you all for joining us. Great, man. Thank you so much. Um, Trey, before we get started, are there any uh, housekeeping um, uh, uh, anything that we need to know about before we get started? You, you got it, Jennings. We'll real quickly run through some logistics for today since we're going to do it a little different <coughs> than the usual webinars. Um, first, hold on, there we go. Um, our speakers today from Retail Strategies and Electives of NC want kind of an interactive discussion today. So feel free to submit questions at any point during today's webinar. And you can do so by using the Q&A box down there at the bottom left, type in your question and submit it and someone will address it um, promptly. If you'd like to ask a question live, you can also click this raise hand icon down at the bottom right. We'll unmute you and you can ask your question live. The chat box will also be available while we prefer you to use the Q&A box. You can type your questions in the chat box as well. And there may be some supplemental resources or links posted in the chat box. So keep a lookout for those. And if at any point today you need to check your audio settings, you can do so by clicking the audio setting tab in the bottom left and adjust your settings. And if you plan to ask a question live, you can also um, check your microphone settings here as well. If you need to adjust the size of your screen today, you can do so by clicking that view options tab in the upper middle and adjust the size of your screen. You can also click the four arrows in the top right corner to enter and exit full screen mode if you need to. And that should cover everything for today. So back to Jennings, I will pass it off to you. All right, great. Thank you, Trey. Appreciate that. And uh, Van, once again, thank you for allowing us to be participating with uh, and a partner with uh, North Carolina East Alliance. Um, uh, you, know, you guys do such a great job for all your 29 uh, counties in the eastern part of the state. and. Uh, just serve as a model, um, really nationwide, for uh, a, a cooperative agency that uh, that really works very hard to improve the, the livelihood of all of its residents in all the counties. And so, just kudos to you for uh, and Trey for a job well done in, in East North Carolina. And thank you. Um, today, we're really excited to uh, have this webinar. And our, our main guest today and speakers is with Retail Strategies out of Birmingham, Alabama. And uh, Electric Cities has had a, a very uh, successful relationship with Retail Strategies for, gosh, Lacey, I guess now it's going on uh, eight years, I think. Uh, and uh, so we've, we've engaged with Retail Strategies in our uh, membership. And, and for those who may not know, Electric Cities serves 51 members in North Carolina, 32 of those members are in East North Carolina. And uh, we have um, uh, engaged Lacey and Retail Strategies in, uh, gosh, I guess 20, so 18, 20 uh, of those markets. And, um, and they've done a fantastic job. Um, and each year seems like they come up with something new to offer our members and, and we're really excited for that partnership. 
Uh, today, we're joined by the COO, Lacey Beasley. She's president of Retail Strategies. And uh, she she has, uh, gosh, I guess you've been in retail real estate, Lacey, since uh, uh, you were 15, back in 2005, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Thank uh, you for that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 15 years yeah. I've been yeah. doing this. <laughs> uh, Lacey lives in Birmingham, and uh, she has prior experience with the shopping center group. Uh, and uh, Dixon County Chamber of Commerce in Tennessee. And uh, she has um, graduated of Lipscomb University. Is that the herd, I think? I'm not sure about that, but uh, anyway. <laughs> the bison, uh, that's right. Bison, bison, gotcha, okay. Mm -hmm. And she earned a Great degree place. there in uh, marketing and management. And uh, uh, Lacey is very involved with ICSC. She serves on a lot of their committees. That's the International Council of Shopping Centers. And uh, she's been recognized for those efforts. She was recognized as the top 40 under 40 and, uh, and top 40 under 40 for the decade. So, uh, so does that mean you get to stay 40 for 10 years, Lacey? I'm not sure. That's, that's, <laughs> that's great. I, I want that one. I, I think it's too late for me to get that one. Uh, but uh, anyway. It's a fake been, ID, Jenny. <laughs> okay. Uh, Lacey is, is published. She's has been published in uh, uh, Site Selection Magazine, which a lot of our, our uh, attendees are very familiar with Site Selection Magazine and the uh, um, Retail Federation. Uh, and uh, she's spoken numerous occasions, and we're very lucky to have her. So she, uh, she grew up in Roswell, New Mexico. And uh, so if there's any ailing questions, Feel free to to uh, ask Lacey about that. <laughs> she's she's the most experienced uh, panelist on that subject that we have. So, um, uh, join us also is Elliot. Elliot is director of real estate with Retail Strategies. Uh, he has he basically focuses on their downtown strategies, and uh, he's also has a long history in in retail recruitment. And um, he also uh, teaches instructor with Retail Academy. And that basically uh, teaches clients how to identify the key real retail sites and target national retailers for the community. Uh, prior to joining Retail Strategies, Elliot worked as a property manager for retail specialists and also worked in the Washington, D.C. area. And I believe, Elliot, you served some time on the Hill. So I did, I did. So I hope you left it in a better place and you found out. <laughs> <laughs> you might need to go back. I'm not I was kidding. about to say, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Times yeah. have changed. <laughs> yeah. Elliot is a native of Birmingham and uh, earned his bachelor's degree in history from Auburn University and is a former board member of the Phoenix Club of Birmingham as well as the Greater Birmingham Auburn Club. So welcome both. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Lacey. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you for that great introduction. It's awesome. Had to top that. Um, as, <laughs> that was uh, so generous with your time and going through the each each of us and our background and and really all that's just to lay the groundwork for today's webinar. We uh, between Jennings, Elliot, and myself, you have about thirty years of experience in this space, and we're just so excited to be here with you and know how valuable your time is. And just thank you to Trey and. Van for organizing this webinar today. We know that retail is really hot on community leaders' minds right now, as it should be. And there's a lot of misconceptions about retail that we're here to discuss with you. And there's different things, um, aspects of retail that are critically important. Um, there's a lot of trends that changed in 2020, a lot of predictions for 2021. And there's a twofold strategy. Uh, when you are looking at your retail, you really need to look at the national retailers on the highway, the main retail corridor, and you also need to look at your downtown and the locally owned businesses. And, and those are very different approaches. But ultimately, one being downtown feeds into your quality of life, your sense of place, the character of your community, that what drives tourism. And then the amenities on your major highway with those national retailers, those are the economic drivers. They drive sales tax returns, jobs, and, and offer all those daily goods and services that people need. And they create that regional draw, that retail synergy that makes somebody come on a Saturday and go through their entire shopping list of everything that they need. And you're the big winner in that. So they have very, very different approaches, uh, downtown uh, retail real estate versus national retail real estate. Uh, my expertise is more in the national side of things. Elliot is really, and I, I talk about trends a little bit more on that national side. 
Elliot is an absolute pro on all things real estate and downtown. And Jennings is a pro all things North Carolina and really knowing those local players that are involved in the communities that are there. And what, what I love about our partnership that we have just enjoyed so much with Electric Cities of North Carolina is we work all over the country. Um, we're in 36 states right now uh, working with communities. We've been doing this at Retail Strategies for over a decade. And we have never seen an organization quite like Electric Cities of North Carolina. We're so proud to partner with them. Their kindness, their generosity, their expertise, the way that they are so passionate about working with their communities and how good they are at making those connections. And what's critically important in anything you do in economic development is longevity. As you know, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So having consistent players and consistent relationships throughout the course of that long-term initiative for economic development is so critically important. And I'd like to address for any, any of you that have heard me ever talk in the last 10 years know this and it for anybody new I'm just going to keep beating this drum uh, as loud as I possibly can but uh, traditional thinking in economic development was that you let retail take care of itself you go after high paying jobs rooftops all of that and then the retail will take care of itself and you don't pay attention to it. You don't put any uh, time, investment or energy into retail. And that trend has dramatically reversed. And that is because of our workforce. It has completely changed from the baby boomer generation where individuals would move to a city and stay in that same job for 30 years to now where it's a millennial generation where they first move somewhere cool and then they back into a job. So how do you create a cool community? You have a vibrant downtown. You have the amenities, the goods and services and restaurants and all those things that they want. So it's really important to get your retail right so you can attract that workforce. Then you can attract those high paying jobs. And that's what we're here to do today. We're experts in retail. <laughs> I don't know anything about industrial. So <laughs> we're so happy to share what we do know and really want to make this interactive. So I'm going to encourage you, please plug in questions. Uh, Jennings is going to moderate the questions. Uh, we are not here to just present what we already know to you. We're more than happy to get some big picture ideas started. Uh, we have a lot of resources on our team. Uh, Elliot did a fantastic webinar last week about what to do with your downtown vacancies and how to fill those real estate vacancies and what you do as a community leader to work with the property owners. Uh, fantastic hour-long webinar and uh, we have a follow-up uh, kind of a frequently asked questions document that can go with that. We're more than happy to share. We have a top 10 uh, tips and tricks for real estate talking about nationals that we can share and then we have a, a 2020 recap, a big picture. If you're to sum up what happened in 2020, um, how do you talk about it? We have all those documents already in place on our website, more than happy to share what our goal is to just empower you with information so you can have a lot of confidence when you're talking about retail in your community. You know those key drivers for what's happening today and what you need to be doing to take those proactive approaches. Um, so you have a great team here. Really appreciate all of you being on it. So feel free, go ahead and start plugging in your questions right now. Um, this, as I said, we can get you started with some talking points, but it's more important to us that we answer the burning questions on your mind. You registered for this webinar for a reason. And if you can walk away with one or two nuggets of knowledge that you didn't know before, then we're gonna consider it a huge success. So, so go ahead and, and look at that Q&A and think about what really motivated you to log in and spend your hour here and plug that question in right now. I mean, we have, right now we have 95 participants on here live. So I'll be real disappointed if I don't get a question in the next five minutes, okay? So y'all go ahead and start plugging them in. But um, while you're thinking about your question that you wanna ask, I'm gonna go ahead and just give you a big picture overview of. 2020. Um, what are the overarching trends? And I, I think you know this, but let's just clear through all the fluff and say what mattered most. I, there was a true acceleration of everything in 2020. In the last 12 months, there hasn't been a single individual or business that has not been impacted by COVID-19. And what it has done in the, in the form of acceleration is it forced people to either do one of two things, adapt or die. Be innovative and move forward and change your company, change your business model, change your personal behavior and thrive, 
or really struggle and have a hard time and you might not survive uh, this world if you were not able to adapt. A lot of retailers that are out there, they are very cautious. At the end of the day, the name of the game is all about profit. So when a retailer, especially if they're publicly traded, they have a lot of accountability to be profitable. So every decision they make is about profit. Well, unfortunately, that stifles innovation. So you have the committee of no with a lot of retailers that sit, sits there and your innovative people that are creative, the R&D team, they're constantly coming up with these new ideas that are ex expensive, but they're not tested and proven. And what this allowed was for all those ideas to be dusted, pulled, uh, pulled off the shelf, dusted off, and brought to life in a great way. So we saw things happen in 2020 that happened in a matter of 12 months that naturally would have happened over a life cycle of five to 10 years. Uh, technology, I would say it advanced it by about 10 years. Um, real estate, some things that happened in real estate, I think it advanced it by about five years. So let's talk about technology, what happened. How about the resurgence of the QR code? You know, the re QR code was dead and gone and now it's everywhere and it's back and it's live and it's so great and so easy. So that's kind of a fun, simple thing that we use every day that we thought was a goner, right? Uh, so there's the QR code. There's everything we're doing about shopping online. Um, it's really wild to look at those trends. So the uh, previous decade from uh, 2000 to 2019, Online retail sales increased by only 5%. In 2020, they increased by 5%. So in one year, they increased as much as they did in the previous decade. Uh, so online sales are here to stay. Any brand that does not incorporate online sales in their strategy in the future will struggle. They're going to have a hard time. And that's true for small business as well, which Elliot can talk about in a minute. Um, so online sales. The next big picture trend that we're seeing in real estate is the drive-throughs drive and curbside pickup. Any brand that was ahead of this, they did great. They capitalized on it. Any brand that did not, they had to figure it out real quickly. <laughs> and so that's changing the way we look at real estate. It's all about in caps with drive-throughs and even the big box, the grocery stores are looking at that um, drive-through and the landlords are having to look at how they reallocate parking spaces to allow for curbside pickup. Um, and municipalities are needing to look at what they're doing with approvals of access points and how they're allowing the indoors to come outdoors. Are you allowing your small businesses to come out into the sidewalk to expand that space and allow for uh, clean air and social distancing, right? So it's, a, it's impacted everybody and, and we're all working together. And I think what we found was a true resiliency of not just ourselves as individuals, but also our, um, our businesses. And ultimately, we're going to be the winners as consumers. Unfortunately, we are incredibly unforgiving as consumers in the retail world. And if retailers don't get it just right, uh, then we don't go back. We're relentless. And so uh, retailers have to get it right. And they knew it and they did. And, and we as consumers are really going to be the benefactors of this. Um, now, let's talk about some of this mainstream media that we see that we're constantly kind of um, combating. One is the real estate of things. So for years, you saw retail apocalypse, retail's going down. Um, that's not true. <laughs> retail is alive and well, and that's still true. So talking about an accelerator, what happened in 2020 was a lot of those brands that were on the 10-year watch list that we were saying they're going to file bankruptcy at some point, they were forced to go ahead and file bankruptcy now because they forgot their customer and they did not innovate and they did not have a good online presence. We think that's a positive thing. They're tired brands that were forgotten and they're freeing up really good retail space that is allowing new and emerging brands that are improved to go into those vacancies. So a lot of disruption in the industry, all very good. Very pleased to report that retail year over year sales were up 5%. So retail's not dead, it's not dying overall at 5%. Now that does include online sales. So that's a huge component of it. And an article came out from CNBC just this week that predicts that retail sales will go up anywhere from six and a half to 8.2% in 2021. Uh, so nothing but growth ahead for retail. It's, it's not dead. It's a really important time to have a, a strategy behind your retail. Your real estate will change in 2021. Your retailers will change in 2021. So having the plan for your national retail and your local retail really matters.
All right. It looks like we have a handful of questions. Thank you uh, Lacey, for asking. Do you mind if I, if I come in just for a second? I, I think you're making some, please, some, fantastic, some fantastic points and just kind of um, expounding what you were saying. I think when we talk about national retail, likely a lot of your communities uh, in North Carolina, you've seen your sales tax generation and your sales tax base go up over the last year. Um, your grocery store is probably putting in record numbers right now. Um, you know, uh, hardware and garden, those types of, uh, you know, how many of us did a DIY project or how many of us got tired of the room we were sitting in for six months and said, I'm either going to sell my home or I'm going to completely renovate this room or whatever it may be, or spend more time in my backyard, things like that, that all, you know, trickled down into sales tax generation. And those types of retailers are on fire. Um, you know, you talked about quick service restaurants and drive throughs um, the Chipotle's of the world, the Chick-fil-A's of the world that already had that app-based ordering system that consumers were comfortable with, they were on fire. You know, you mentioned CNBC, like every morning when we were, you know, we were all in lockdown, I would put on CNBC and they would put on Chick-fil-A CEO constantly. And he was just reporting just record numbers because people were already used to pulling up, having that kind of seamless um, app-based ordering and, and it, there was no issue. Your small businesses are adapting to that. You're going to continue to see that with all of these kind of national and regional retailers, whether it be drive through, whether it be via that app based ordering system. And that's going to be huge. So you're seeing lots of retailers that are doing better um, and are, are even, you know, are seeing record numbers in the last year. And that's going to grow. You know, we talk about all the time that retailers show value two ways to their investors. Um, and that's either by year over year sales or that's by opening new doors. So for, for the last you know, 12 months, basically, better part of 12 months, a lot of retailers were sitting on their hands. And ultimately, they're going to be looking to do deals in 2021. And they're going to be looking to do them in communities like yours. North Carolina is an incredibly fast-growing state. We all know this. We hear those stories constantly. Um, and it, and it's quite frankly, it's more open than a lot of other states are in this current situation. So we'll see a lot of that. Um, you know, I also want to say that you're talking about kind of pushing things down the road and, and just moving us five years down the road. I think in a lot of ways, you know, I think we forget and we need to talk about that the millennial is the number one consumer in America right now. A lot of the trends that we've seen are leaning into the millennial consumer, and we're going to see a lot of that growth going forward. So retail is going to change, um, and however you can best um, go after the millennials in your community and their try to spending patterns and things like that, you're going to see a lot of benefit there. Great, great points, Elliot. Thank you so much for sharing that and giving actual examples. You're right. Chipotle is a huge superstar. Um, Shake Shack. I mean, traditional Absolutely. thinking is just that these fast food restaurants have drive throughs but now even the great, you know, casual dining is incorporating drive throughs right? Or are you seeing that as well? Oh, absolutely. You know, and, and, you know, Panda Express, for example, right? Like they didn't used to have a drive through They have to have a drive through now. That's, you know, there's all of these types of, of non-negotiables that used to be, have a little bit more wiggle room. They're going to want the drive through Everybody's going to want that ability to have carry out. And then also when we talk about downtown, you know, I think when everything shut down, there was this, you know, in April and May, what were the type of retailers that you wanted to go support when things started kind of opening back up? It was your downtown businesses. It was those local businesses, those generational businesses that you wanted to make sure they survived and you wanted to spend your dollar back in those places to, to help. I mean, that's how I felt. I live in the downtown of my community in Birmingham and I, you know, Lacey and I actually live very close to each other and we supported our local grocery store. We supported the local restaurants within walking distance to us in however ways we, you know, whatever ways we could. So you're going to see a lot more of that. You're going to see a lot of success back in your downtown. Mm -hmm. Well, what are you seeing as far as the trends that are happening in downtowns? I know that um, a lot of downtowns that we're working with currently are, are just have a, a revived interest in revitalizing their downtown and making sure that they're filling those vacant spaces. So what would you recommend to a community leader? They're looking around and saying, okay, the time is right. People are working from home. Our sales tax dollars are higher than they've traditionally been, which is what we experience all over rural America. So, you know, people are staying at home and shopping. 
and it takes a major disruptor to change people's shopping patterns. So to your point, what were the first places you went and supported uh, when you could get out and, and go again? It wasn't that national, it was that local. So how do we capitalize on people's changed habits for shopping right now and use that as a as momentum to revitalize our downtowns? What's the first step in getting started with the downtown? I mean, number one, if you don't, you, you first off, you need to create a downtown team. Who is the person who is going to be responsible for your downtown? Is it your main street director? Is it a downtown development authority? Is it someone within your community? Is it a team? A lot of times that's a great approach. Then you need to have an inventory of all of your downtown buildings. If I was moving to your community and I wanted to open a business, where could I do that feasibly in the next 90 days? If I wanted to open a coffee shop, could you send me to that space? right now or send me to three potential spaces for me to go to. If I wanted to open a boutique, could you do the same? You need to know those things and you need to be talking to those brokers, those property owners, and ultimately figure out where your best, you know, we use the term vanilla shell constantly. And you got to think about that in your downtown as well. What does vanilla shell mean? (laughs) Yeah. So a a vanilla shell basically means it has, you know, it has a finished floor. A lot of, a lot of retail spaces don't. It has a good roof and and working shape. It has electricity. Um, It has demising walls up. um, It has HVAC, things like that. The things that a retailer needs to move in and at limited capital, they can put in, you know, if you're going to give them a construction allowance, they could just put that into their space or if they could come in and feasibly operate within 90 days. I know you North Carolinians love cookout. Mm-hmm. They just built a cookout by my, my house the, uh, within the last couple of months. And on that point, it's the same thing with any type of, they, they built that thing in 90 days and it was operating. So you can build a quick service restaurant in the span of 90 days. And with a lot of you know, triple net leases that I've worked on in my landlord days, they would give you, you know, basically 90 days free rent to get open, to put that money in and get operating. So think about that with your downtown space. If you're, you know, if uh, as a community, if you're trying to invest, and I, and I don't know if you want to, you know, expound on that, but as a community, if you want to invest, how uh, how walkable is your downtown? How well lit is your downtown? You know, are, are you investing in those types of things to promote walkability, to promote density? Do you have a residential population in your downtown? Obviously, right now, a lot of people are not working, are still working from home. So, how do we get people back into the downtown? It's residential. And nobody tells the story about a downtown better than the people who live there. Um, and, and Lacey, and I, you Amen. can speak, we can both speak to that personally, right? Um, and there, there are narratives, oh, yeah, whether it's about that it's not, yeah, that it's not safe or that it, the, the streets roll up at five o'clock, whatever your story is in your downtown, how can you change that narrative? That's such a great point. And uh, Elliot mentioned the walkability assessment. Uh, feel free to email either one of us. I'm just Lacey, L-A-C-Y at retailstrategies.com. Uh, you can find me online, Elliot. We're, we're on there, retailstrategies.com. You can find our stuff with our email addresses. Just shoot either of us an email. We will give you a customized walkability assessment for your community. Um, this is just no cost. Happy to start that discussion with you and just talk through what that scoring system's like. Elliot, can you explain a little bit that walkability assessment? What, how does it come up with that score and what is it looking at? Yeah, absolutely. So the walkability score is we're going to go into your downtown. We're going to try to basically pinpoint the center of what we consider as your downtown. And then we talk about the, your walkability score is based on the businesses within that ring. So the ring is basically within a 20 minute walk time of the center of your downtown. Let's say you've got a courthouse in the middle of the downtown square. And then within that, there's going to be a a 20 minute ring, a 10 minute ring and a five minute ring. And then we're going to give you a market analysis of basically who your, your trade area is with, or who are the people within your downtown? How feasible is it for me to walk from point A to point B if I live in a historic neighborhood, or if I live in a loft or something along those lines, how, how many businesses are there? How many people are walking to work, riding a bike to work? You know, how, how, how easy is it for me to basically live a, you know, a, a, a walkable life in a downtown? And there's that just right there can give you a score on how you can either promote that as a positive or the where the things that you can really work on um, to try to make that a more feasible environment. 
Okay, and that's what we love doing is these are not to, um, they're not in any way, shape or form. It, I mean, it's a way to say strengths and weaknesses, what you can work on. So even if the, those score is a zero to a hundred, I mean, Manhattan gets a hundred. A lot of communities that we work with get between, you know, 40 to 60 is, is an yeah. average score. So, uh, you know, you might be laughing thinking nobody in my town walks 20 minutes downtown, <laughs> um, but that is what, what they recommend is a 20 minute walk time. Um, and we have a great question here from Steve Stephen Penn asking about how how does the daytime population matter for a downtown um, employees working close in close proximity close proximity to those retailers and restaurants? Um, how does that impact the buildings and the businesses? Yeah, I mean that that's it's huge. A daytime population, as with anything, you know, I try to think of a downtown, your main street. Think of it. Think of it in the same way we think of shopping centers. I come from the world of, um, you know, being a landlord for shopping centers. So I try to take some of those key things back into your downtown. A retailer needs a daytime population. Ultimately, we want people to spend more than thirty minutes in your downtown. I, I, you know, I've used the term loiter before, but I don't know that that's always the most popular way to go about it. But really, like, how are you just? promoting people spending more than 30 minutes downtown. So is that me coming and parking my car and going to work? Is that me going to a coffee shop, working from that coffee shop, maybe going to an incubator space or a WeWork or you know something like that, and then walking to lunch? Anything you can do to promote that via traffic counts, via a list of employers and how many people work there, it's, the, it's very much the same. And that right there is going to build itself. And that's going to help someone who is looking to be an entrepreneur and open that small business in your downtown feel more confident about that location. Great, great one. And now we have a really good question here. And you mentioned Main Street. Um, at retail strategies uh, and downtown strategies where we're all and we have retail academy as well so as a consultant firm working with municipalities all over the country there's there's really three different ways that we consult with municipalities so there's a uh, retail strategies recruitment services which is our partnership with electric cities in north carolina currently and through listening to all of our partners they constantly were saying we want local businesses downtown we want downtown revitalization and from there we birth uh, downtown strategies. And so Elliot Cook and Jim Gregory uh, work together on downtown strategies and all those initiatives. And, and everything we do here is taking the approach of not just a study that sits on a shelf, it's really practical application of how to get started tomorrow in a very feasible way. There's a lot of planning, there's a lot of studies that exist in the world that are just not financially feasible, or they're too long-term to really wrap your head around. And um, in a lot of ways, we're, we're all practitioners. We all come from a background in this space. Elliot's been uh, doing this for eight years. I mean, he's managed several properties. He's been a retail recruiter. He's, he's worked um, on outreach, worked with community leaders. So we, um, it's the nature of anything economic development, we get rejected a lot. It's just <laughs> part of outreach and it is part of being aggressive and it's part of what you do. You don't mind being told and you have no call reluctance, right? Um, so so through, through a lot of rejection, we have learned, yes, this works, no, this doesn't. This is these things are inspiring and long-term plans, and then these are the things to get started on now that make sense. So I say all that to uh, really set the stage for one of the questions that came in from a very dear friend, uh, Toby Bennington in oh, yeah. Alabama. We go way back. <laughs> We've uh, known Toby for, has been a very loyal and great partner we worked with for, gosh, I think a decade now. So it's just awesome to see Toby on here and asked a very important question, which I think is important to address uh, there's a Main Street America is a fantastic program and we have downtown strategies and and there's ways that um, well, I, the question is, how do the two work together? What are the similarities and what are the differences? And I'm I'm paraphrasing your question, Toby, I didn't ask it exactly the way you wrote it. But um, Elliot, if you could address that so there's not uh, confusion in, on the two platforms. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll give a, a great example, actually. Um, a, a shout out to our friends in Wilson, North Carolina, a partner of ours that we were just in Wilson last month. 
Uh, I know one of the, the reasons that we engaged or that we were engaged with Wilson was that basically they are a great member of the North Carolina Main Street program. And we, one of the first things we always try to do if your community is not involved with your state Main Street program or have, has not hired a Main Street director, we encourage you to go do that. We're a partner with Main Street America. We feel very, very, uh, are big advocates of that organization. Um, and we think that they do wonderful, wonderful things. I know with Wilson, um, a piece of the reason that we were engaged in a partnership and are engaged in a partnership with them was about that kind of five-year refresh um, and, and making sure that, um, you know, they were kind of refreshing their program and then with their strategic plan and things like that. Toby, you know, to your point, and Toby, we, we know you quite well and um, enjoy, always enjoy talking to you. You know, really one of the things we try to work together with Main Street is helping, helping with that plan. Um, you know, helping making sure that we can promote downtown, we can help implement some of those things as a partner, you know, a triumvirate partner within the community, Main Street, and our, and our partnership. Another thing that I always try to do as well is obviously focus on real estate. I'm in the real estate business. I'm trying to generate sales tax for a community, whether that be on their national corridor or in their downtown. I think people very much want to see their downtown continue to grow. They want to, they, people want experiential, you know, they want to experience when they spend their dollar, whether that means that they're going to a restaurant and they want a cool, you know, almost global experience within their, their, you know, smaller community, or they want something really cool where they can take an Instagram and feel, you know, wh whatever it is. Um, we want to really capitalize on those things. And, and we feel very strong that Main Street helps set that tone. It helps educate the community and we just want to help uh, and, and take that to the next level. Absolutely. That's a great way to describe it. And, and Main Street's a fantastic program and we really just want to complement it by adding our expertise of retailers, restaurants, and real estate. Yeah. Uh, so and, and data as well. And data. Yes. Great. <laughs> A lot of data, <laughs> which leads to something I, I don't want to neglect. I think prior to this webinar, a question had come in about um, mobile tracking data. Uh, so, and Jennings, uh, feel free to uh, jump in on this as well. I know you're you're a pro in this space, but I'll I'll give you a high level overview, and and then Elliot, you can talk a little bit about how we're using mobile tracking data, and, and you as well, Jennings. Um, so the, the question is, uh, it's, it's fairly new technology. Our firm invests about $200,000 a year in research and GIS and our director of, of research actually came to us with a background from Amazon and Sam's Club. So she knows what she's doing and it's a lot of fun to play in that space. And the whole point of research is really to lead you to a point that you can make um, educated next steps but then you have the reality of the marketplace, right? So uh, just, you might have all the research perfect, but then you might have a difficult um, property owner or little nuances that you understand from a local level. And that's what we always wanna do when we work with a community is take your local story, package it up in the retail language, and then present that retail language to the decision makers and the investors that are ultimately looking for, how do we make a profit? At the end of the day, every piece of information you supply them, that is what it needs to lead to. How is this information going to tell the story of profit? And so mobile tracking data is critically important because it helps you analyze a retail trade area. And the way this works is if your location services are on on your phone, then, uh, and you have a free app like the Weather Channel or Pandora or anything like that, they send you ads. And every time they send you an ad, they're pinging your location on your phone. Well, every time they ping your location, they're tracking that. So what we do for a downtown region or a Walmart, whatever it might be, is we just geofence that region. We look at the last year and we look who shopped in that area and where they live, where they spend their evenings. And that way you get a true um, customized trade area that goes beyond drive times, goes beyond municipal boundaries and says, this is your potential consumer that you could have in your area. Uh, so that's one way to use it. There's a lot of ways to do it. Mobile tracking data is still fairly new and continues to improve every year. I think it's only been around for about two or three years. We were early adopters of this technology and it continues to advance, but it's becoming more critically important in the um, in the national retailers analysis of what they're doing with real estate. 
But Elliot, how are you using it downtown and how, how is that working with um, things like tourists and festivals and uh, you know the things that get outside of nationals? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I cannot tell you how essential mobile tracking data is talking about your trade area. I think too often as a community, we spend our time focusing our efforts and telling our story based on our city limits. We see all the time in communities like yours, let's say that you're a community of 10,000 people but you are the county seat or you are the major kind of national trade area for your county. You have the Walmart or maybe you have the best barbecue restaurant in your county, something like that. And granted, I'm, the, the story that needs to be told there is that inevitably people are coming from outside of just your city limits and spending money in your community. Other retailers want to be around that. If you're trying to recruit that downtown business, showing that people are coming to the Mexican restaurant or people are coming to the barbecue restaurant and that they could also capture some of those dollars is how you sell a retailer or how you sell a potential new business on opening a new, new location in either the downtown or across from the Walmart or wherever it may be. That shows, you know, we show all that see all the time that let's say a community has 10,000 people but their customized trade area based off of mobile tracking data is like 35,000. You need to be telling the story of the 35,000, not the 10,000, because it's all valid and it's all legitimate. And that's what retailers want to see. They believe in mobile tracking. They pay it for it themselves. So anything you can do to paint that picture is how you breed success. Yeah, I'll add too on that, um, uh, Elliot, is that you know, we've seen mobile tracking you know, provides some great information uh, as far as downtown in the in, in relationship to number of business hours. I mean, any downtown Main Street manager uh, has been preaching forever about hours. You know, uh, you know, you still have some of those mom and pop shops that will close at you know, five o'clock. You know, and and uh, and that's just really frustrating to any chamber of commerce and downtown manager. But they've never had really information to show them, um, you know, some proof in, in that assumption. And now with mobile tracking, you can, you, you can see that, you know, for certain communities and the reports that I've seen showing anywhere from, you know, 20 to 30% uh, of sales or, or not really sales, but volume of traffic occurs after five o'clock. So, you know, you can take this mobile tracking data and go to these retailers or, or whatever your chamber of commerce meetings and, and have this information to back up your assumptions on that. And, and also we've seen it on, on um, festivals, right? So that every community in North Carolina that has a festival wants to know what impacts that that festival has and, and is the ROI there. Um, and, and when you go and, and get your sponsorships, you know, it, 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 can you can you effectively convince your sponsorship that this is worth a, a five ten thousand dollar investment for a sponsorship? And you know, mobile tracking data can can show you. Uh, I know one example was like, you know, a local festival compared themselves to a national festival, and it's totally two different. And actually, the the local festival is well, more well attended and had a, a bigger draw for a 10 mile area around that location. So they use that information to go to the sponsors and say, hey, we get just the same number of visitors as a national uh, event, but all of our, most of our customers are within 10 miles of, of downtown. So we can concentrate on, on specifically to that, that the type of sponsors. Um, and, you know, but you know, I think one thing to keep in mind on this mobile tracking data is what it can't do. You know, the mobile tracking data cannot give you sales. It can't tell you how much money those people spent at that festival, but it can tell you that, hey, you know, we had 18,000 visitors, you know, and, and a, on a three-day festival, the, the, the second day was the most attended, and they stayed an average of 80 minutes. And, and the, these people had an average income of $65,000 uh, and they had a peak time of, of 2 to 3 p.m. So, um, and that 75% of the visitors traveled less than five miles or something like that, or more, maybe more than five miles. And so it can give you the demographics, but, it, it, but it's also important to know what it can't give you. 
And um, so it's, it's very, very important. It's very new, uh, you know, we're learning it as well. Uh, but uh, it's, it, it, it confirms maybe some of the suspicions or assumptions that you're making about your market. Um, but it also helps to, um, uh, to know, I guess, some, some new information that you'd never thought that was true about, about your community. Jenny, I think you bring up a, a fantastic point. Last week, we were in Columbia, Tennessee, you know, about an hour outside of Nashville, and they have a big tourism draw. Um, and, and part of what their downtown director was really hoping and the city was trying to hope was to get businesses to stay open on Sunday or have extended hours on Sunday. And we had pulled a tourism study from a, a, a retailer in their courthouse square and showed the mobile tracking data from Sunday. And it was one of the highest days of the week that people were coming to the square. And this woman that owned this antique store, we, we were kind of walking the community and we went in there and that was a couple hours later. And she had gone and looked at her accounting software after the meeting that we all had and found out that Sunday was her third highest generating day of the week. And I think she was closing at like two in the afternoon. She was like, I need to can extend my hours. So exactly what you're saying, it really does show, um, it, it shows you know, when people are coming and can really prove those points. And you were talking about, it doesn't show sales, but you can use those two things together to really, you know, learn more about who your consumer is and when they're there. That's right. That's right. A great story. It's a great, how many years have we been hearing that from chambers? We want our business to <laughs> extend their store hours. And, and now we have actual data to back it up. That's, That's right. a great story. Um, mm. Have a good question here, which Liz, by the way, thank you for the great job you do with Main Street. And thank you for uh, plugging that in. And, and I hope everybody sees that. If you're not in the Main Street program, then uh, be sure and let her know. But um, here we have a question. Um, Todd, thank you for submitting this and really want to brag on you and the success you've had in Farmville, North Carolina, uh, about 5,000 people. You've had a very successful run for the last uh, six to seven years. You had 29 empty storefronts, and now you only have eight. So major kudos. Uh, everybody reach out to Todd and see what he did for the last six to seven years because that's just awesome. awesome. Uh, love it. And you have pharmacy, restaurant, hardware store, coffee shop, ice cream shop. I mean, all kinds of cool stuff. So the question is, uh, what are innovative space fillers going to be post-COVID? Fun question. What do you think, Elliot? You know, I would say one of the first things to do is there, you know, there's all these cool terms that have been floated around over the last year. Incubator spaces ghost kitchens, things like that. I, I very much try to focus on adhesion. So trying to think about those kind of small spaces. Mm -hmm. A lot of times I think in our downtown when there is vacancy, it's like the old Crest department store or the, the bank or the it's movie developed. theater that we focus all of our efforts into because there's nostalgia there or it's just, it takes up a large space. But a lot of times maybe there's a thousand square foot vacancy right next door. Or maybe there is, you know, a 500 square foot vacancy. Focus on those guys. It takes a lot less capital for them to move in. A lot of times your businesses that are moving into a downtown space are not the most well capitalized people. They're not the, you know, they don't have the highest credit um, and they need a chance. So if they're coming in at, let's say, a dollar a square foot in a 500 square foot space, they're set up for success much more than somebody in a 5,000 square foot space. Um, it just, you know, it makes economic sense there. But talking about those innovative space fillers, anything you can do to get people, I mean, North Carolina, North Carolinians, I can tell you right now, people are moving to your state from the Northeast and all over, you know, maybe, maybe they're moving out of Raleigh or they're moving out of Charlotte into your space because they can have a more feasible way of life. They can buy a home. You know, once again, I, you know, not to keep hitting on the millennial, but because they are the number one consumer, I think people forget the millennial are the millennials are getting married and they're having children. And so they're, they're looking for different things now. And a lot of them are going to be able to work from home for good. There's lots of companies that are allowing people to work. I mean, you know, our company is experiencing that. I saw Spotify the other day has basically said, if you want to work from home forever, you can do that. Um, those types of groups, they're going to want to get out of their house from time to time though. So anything you can do, you know, to have those kind of shared communal office spaces and then incubator spaces, you know, I talk about all the time that there are going to be so many people who are looking for that second or third, you know, career. And a lot of them are going to want to try, 
you know, have that entrepreneurial chance of opening a restaurant. They've been making sourdough bread for the last couple of months and now they want to do a bakery or whatever it is. Um, anything you can do to kind of set them up for success. So um, ghost kitchens, I know in the last webinar, someone asked what a ghost kitchen is. You know, a lot of restaurants and, and retailers are realizing that they don't necessarily need a storefront. Maybe all that they are is delivery. And so there's kind of these kind of back of house you know, you could have maybe some retail space on the front and in the back of house, there is like a kind of a shared communal kitchen where multiple different retail you know, groups could be making uh, meals and then delivering them to you or carry out out of the front of it. So those are the trends you're going to see. National guys are getting into that too. Um, so it's going to be a big, a big thing going forward. So hopefully that answers the question. Uh, I'm so you hit on a couple of really key points that I just want to emphasize it is one, I, I think so often an entrepreneur, um, they overestimate the amount of space they need and the square footage and how expensive rent is they really need to be operating in 500 square feet or 1000 square feet and oftentimes those buildings are four to 5000 square feet so what can you do as a community leader to pair up four or five entrepreneurs to split up that space and and all go in together and which businesses complement each other so that's you know the question always is as a community leader what's our role you know there's the private side and then there's what you do and and your connector your information share your knowledge base and um, so that that's what um, Elliot and Jen are encouraging the lot of property owners and entrepreneurs to consider is, is breaking that up. The smaller space really important to the business plan. Um, the other is this uh, ghost kitchen idea. One of our um, our sister company, Retail Specialists, they have our full service commercial real estate firm. One of their team members, Hayden Smith, actually ran a commissary kitchen here um, in Birmingham for years. And when I was learning from him how he did it, it was amazing. He had um, multiple shifts morning for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And people would come in in two to three hour intervals and they would cook the meal that mattered to them. And they'd either load it up in their food truck or they'd load it up in their, their car and then go deliver it. So um, even though it was you know a handful of, of smaller kitchen spaces that they could rent out, um, then he was absolutely multiplying that space and the impact of it um, by organizing all that. And they would just pay for the time that they were there. So consider that as a model. Um, if you go to retailspecialist.com, uh, you can find the full report that he wrote on food halls and ghost kitchens. Really great report if you want to take a deeper dive on that. Um, great. Um, okay, Elliot, we have, how can local e-commerce players coordinate with local and national retailers in a community? Yeah, you know, I, I think that a big piece of what you need to do um, is you need to uh, if, talk about Shopify, you know, talk about a lot of these, you know, when you talk about QR codes, talking about delivery groups, things like that, um, you know, I, I, I saw a really cool, I, you know, just kind of trying to be broad in my answer of e-commerce and Lacey, I'll let you expound on it as well. Um, you know, one of the cool things I thought was we were in a, a very rural community in Alabama a couple months ago and they had turned the old historic jail into a coffee shop, but they didn't need all of the space for the coffee shop and the back of it was actually an Amazon fulfillment center. And I didn't realize that they, they were outsourcing that to these more rural communities, but splitting up spaces like that, and then also trying to identify, you know, the best way to um, make sure that your delivery services, if you have them, or your local, um, you know, e uh, local Shopify's and things like that, anything you can do to set up small businesses for success is key, is how they survive, is how they adapt, and is extremely, extremely important. E-commerce is important. It's not going anywhere. It's going to continue to grow. We've seen it grow, and people over the last year have definitely um, leaned more into it, but we use the term omni-channel all the time. You are going to see a lot of people are, you know, ICSC put out um, in the fourth quarter or the other day, fourth quarter uh, data, and they did a, a Q and A with you know, a, a study. And I think over 60% of retailers or of the people they ask said that they would shop back in store and were looking forward to like their old spending patterns and their old shopping patterns. But they did say that they were going to be much more intentional about it. So they're going there for a reason instead of just kind of blindly shopping and walking around. So 
And Lacey, I, I know you, you'll have a lot to add to that as oh, well. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I think that's a great question. And you're right. I think it's so important right now. Um, uh, so locally, a few, a few thoughts here. Um, so locally, as Elliot hit on, Shopify is very easy if they want to, and it's inexpensive. So if a local entrepreneur does not have an online store and they want one, go there. Now, another way, that is if they have their own branded online store. Now, an even easier path to take is to sell your product through social media. You can sell it through Google, Facebook, Instagram, and it's pretty, all you have to do is Google it and then follow the steps, right? So they don't necessarily have to set up their own online store in order to use those social media platforms to do it. Um, there's been a lot of discussion and research done about can you have a local marketplace, right, that they go to the Chamber of Commerce website and all your small businesses and all their products are in one central location with one central shopping cart. I'll tell you the major, major challenges with that. Um, you have multiple players and they all have a different point of sale system, which is a challenge to inventory if you're a small business owner and you have two shirts or you have one piece of unique pottery from an artist, what happens when you sell it online at the same time you sell it in the store? Unless you have direct seamless integration of the two, um, then you're, you could be double selling products so you can't reconcile at the end of the day. And that's a major challenge, not a challenge for nationals because they'll have a thousand of that shirt, <laughs> big challenge for locals. So there's a, still a few little practical hiccups. We, we have looked into this quite a bit. I think somebody's going to figure it out. How do you become, you know, the Etsy of small businesses and how does the local community support that? It is not figured out yet, but I think a lot of people are interested in that. Um, so Going to Elliot's point about um, really that omni-channeling that is so important. Uh, we're more informed when we go into a store. We already have our mind made up on what we want. Now, the big thing that retailers are pushing is how do you buy online? They ship it to you. And well, one of two things, you either pick it up in the store called Bopus, buy online, pick up in store, or um, or you return in the store, right? So if it's you know, spring is coming, you buy 25 swimsuits, <laughs> you try them all on at home, you return 25 of them if you're like me. And me and that whole process takes about a month and I'm really bad about going and returning stuff. So if I can return it directly to the store and then go in the store and shop, then they have a way of capturing me. So retailers are really trying to figure that out. Um, and omni-channeling is essentially what you do through your Chipotle app or your uh, Starbucks app. You know, it's just super quick and you go and you plug it in and even Chick-fil-A is doing the stalls now. You just pull up to stall three and they bring it to you and hand it to you. That that type of stuff is going to last and um, we as consumers pretty much demand it. Um, online grocery shopping has changed the lives of mothers across America. It's the best thing that has happened to the family dynamic. It's, it's awesome. And so there's nothing but growth ahead for uh, grocery store, online shopping and and those things. So how do you get the locals and the nationals playing together on the same platform? That is not yet figured out. But one of the things that we advised as a company early on, um, again, on our website, any of these things I've mentioned, feel free to email me and remind me, or you can just dig around on our website and find it. They're all free resources. Um, but we had a local restaurant guide because there was a lot of confusion early on about uh, what delivery service each restaurant was using. I mean, Yelp had not caught up with it, things of that nature. So you could always have a local guide that um, really highlights those businesses that do have their own online store and drive people to that online store for that local business. Um, but as far as one shopping cart and that seamless integration of multiple businesses, that is not yet um, a tool that's been discovered that we've been able to find anyway. I hope that helps answer that question. <laughs> Long-winded, so forgive yeah, me. That's great. That's great. And one thing I, you mentioned Etsy there, uh, just a little antidote, antidote there is that, you know, everybody remembers the Bernie Sanders mittens, right? Well, that propelled like 1.9 million sales on Etsy during that month. It's incredible. Wow. Wow. I mean, those... <laughs> That, I mean, I just can't imagine being that lady that that did those that mittens. That teacher. She, yeah, that's yeah. crazy. Crazy. Bye. One point nine. Knit. I'll see you later. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <Wow. laughs> I mean, just overnight, randomly, social media just changes your whole business and just blows it up. And 
So yeah. if, you're, if your port says do something like that, then I think that's that's really interesting. Um, you know, uh, we had a question about uh, rural retailers like Dollar General. You know, um, and it kind of kind of also uh, hits on another topic that Lacey and I have talked, and Lacey, I think it was really the uh, topic of your article in Site for Some Magazine about how rural areas are actually you know doing really well you know, during. Uh, the pandemic, um, just on a, on, a, on a competition type basis. I mean, so I, I think you can, and we're, we're really running out of time. So maybe uh, we'll, we'll wrap up with, with that question and, and then we'll turn it back over to Trey for wrap up. And, uh, and then we'll just please know that any questions that we didn't get answered, we'll certainly get those answered to you uh, after the webinar. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jennings. This has been fun. Thank you, Trey and Van, for letting us do this. And thank you for, to all of our participants for, for your attentiveness. A lot of you hung on there to the end. And again, just we want to be a, a free resource to you. We just believe in empowering communities with information and anything we can share, we want to. So uh, applaud you for doing what's right for your community and taking the time to learn. Well, thank you, panelists. Um, so let me just understand this. Um, Jennings, you guys and Lacey will do a walk around or at, at least take an initial look with non electric electricities, towns and cities, a discussion with some of that type of stuff. And Lacey, I know you've got multiple things that Trey can just link on to our onto this webinar and promote that you have on your website um, that we can do from there. So there's a lot of follow-up stuff to attend um, to, and you guys are being many gracious, Brenda and Electric Cities, for allowing us to go to other areas, other cities, towns in Eastern North Carolina for you guys to take a look and see what you maybe suggest that they do. And also, Jennings, is it right, some of the cell phone tracking that you were talking about before? Um, for festivals, other type stuff, I guess we can chat about how all that would, would go down because that's just fascinating to me that you can see where people are coming from, where they spend their time in your town and where they spend the night and where they leave and go to. That's just incredible information. That, um, it sure is. It sure is, man. And absolutely be glad to help any way we can. Okay. Fantastic. Um, I guess there's Anything else, if you have any more questions and you send them in, we'll make sure that um, the team here gets it. Thank you for joining us today. We are gonna do a lot more advocacy in the future. We want you to be a part of our advocacy team. So please join us. Trey, is there anything else? No, that's it. Once the recording of this webinar has finished processing, I'll put it in an email and send it to all registrants as well as um, uh, information from Lacey, Elliot, and Jennings as well. Fantastic. Absolutely. Have a great day. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.